right, good afternoon, TLC. Good afternoon, good afternoon. Man, happy Mother's Day. Happy Mother's Day. It's a good day. Um, on Friday night, Trisha was like, hmm, I wonder what Seth is going to get me for Mother's Day. And I was like, what, what do you mean? <laughs> right? And then just the realization was like, oh, shoot, you're a mom. Oh, no. <laughs> so I was like, hey, so, so what do you want Seth to get you? Like, I don't know. What does Seth want to give me? <laughs> and I'm like, game over. <laughs> game over. So make sure you take care of your moms. Take care of your moms. Okay? I am the worst with gifts, you guys. But, um, man, but take care of your moms. Love on them. Okay? Today, take them out. Show them they're appreciated. All right. My name is Tony. I am a young adult pastor here at TLC. Glad to have you. Glad to have you. It's a good day. Uh, man. What do we have in store for you guys? We are in the book of Acts. We're in the book of Acts. It is the series on touching the city. We really want you guys to be a part of uh, going out, engaging, and being a part of this city, right? And the story of Acts is the story of the origin of the first church and what they did. And it's an amazing story. And as we, as we get into the origin of these Christians, you know, who they are, their characteristics, um, I, w- I want to share with you guys a principle today, Okay. Principle today, it's, it's called necessary but not sufficient. Necessary but not sufficient, okay? And it means something like this. For example, let's say I live in a town, and in this town, all doctors must, must wear a white coat, okay? Now, anyone else can wear a white coat, but all doctors must wear a white coat. So if I'm a doctor, what's necessary? White coat, right? But if I have a white coat, does that necess- does that, is that sufficient enough to say I'm a doctor? No, okay? That's necessary, but not sufficient. And so in the same way, okay, a lot of times people come and they ask, you know, I, I ask them, usually after high school, when they leave and they go off to college and they kind of fall away from the faith, or maybe they graduate from college and they start working and life is actually hard, right? And they kind of start far away from the faith. And so I ask them the question, so what happened? You know, what's going on? So I, I tried it. I was a Christian back then. You know, I, I, I did the stuff. And so I ask them the question usually, what does, what does, it, what does it mean for you to be a Christian? And they'll say something like, I, I went to church, I believed in the teachings, you know, I sought to live a good life, right? Now what you don't realize is that those things are necessary, but they are not sufficient. They are necessary, but they are not sufficient. Let me, let me tell you what I mean. Like, yes, to be a Christian, it means that you should know the doctrines. You know, our, our men's group, uh, just shameless plug, our men's group, what we've been trying to do for the past year, right, is go through the doctrines. We've, I think we got past God. We're in the Holy Spirit right now, right? It took about eight months, but, you know, it's still good, right? We're slowly going through it. I have, I'm patient, and so eventually all of our guys will know the doctrines, right? You should know it, but you know, realize, you realize something else? The Bible says, James says, the demons know it, and they shudder. Actually, they know it better than you, right? So yes, to be a Christian, you should know the doctrines, but it's not sufficient enough, because why? Even demons don't. Even demons know. Secondly, yes, to be a Christian, you should have live a good life. But guess what? There are plenty of people who also live good lives. It's necessary for a believer to have a life that reflects holiness and godliness, generosity, self-sacrifice. It's necessary. But just because you do it is not sufficient to say, I am a Christian. You guys following me? You guys following me? Yes, it is necessary for a Christian to go to church, but just because you go to church doesn't necessarily mean you're a Christian. Just, just the fact that if I'm, in a, if I'm in a garage, it doesn't mean I'm a car, right? So if I sit in the church, it doesn't mean I'm a Christian, right? And so these marks, yes, they are necessary, but they're not sufficient for a believer. And so when we look into the story of Acts, we look in the story, we see the origin. It's an origin story, okay, of the first real Christians. The first of them. And we're going to see signs. And if they're the first real Christians, there are very unique signs. And it's not just going to church. And it's not just knowing the scripture. It is not just living a good life. There are very, very unique signs that shows you, that makes you a Christian. Okay? And we're going to talk about these four signs today. I, I always preach in three, three points today. Four points, okay? All right. Four points, four unique signs that makes you a Christian. 
that you would know that you're a real Christian. Okay? Because you have to ask yourself the question. Sometimes we leave, sometimes we disappear, and we say, oh, yeah, I did the cool Christian thing. Okay, but were you really a Christian? Because there are unique signs that marks you. Okay? So as we go through it, let's, uh, let's, let's see. Okay? Acts chapter 4, verse 23. Okay? Acts chapter 4, what's going on here? The beginning of, the book of, uh, beginning of Acts chapter 4, James and Peter, they were arrested. Right? They preached, they did a miracle, and then the chief priests and the Sanhedrin, they arrested them and said, you better not do it again. Don't preach the name of Jesus ever again. If you do, you will be jailed, you might be flogged, and you might even be killed. And then Peter was like, who are you to tell us to stop? So figure it out. We're not stopping. Right? So they go back and they tell the church what happened to them, what happened to uh, their personal experience, and the church begins to do something. And in this act, it represents the first unique sign of what it means to be a Christian. Okay, Acts chapter 4, verses 23 to 37. We're going to read a little bit of it. I'm going to read 23 to 30 first. Acts chapter 4, verses 23 to 30. On their release, Peter and John went back to their own people and reported all that the chief priests and elders had said to them. And when they had heard this, they raised their voices together in prayer to God. Sovereign Lord, they said, you made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything in them. You spoke by the Holy Spirit to the mouth of your servant, our father David. Why did the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth take their stand and the rulers gather together against the Lord and against his anointed one. Indeed, Herod and Pontius Pilate met together with the Gentiles and the people of Israel in this city to conspire against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed. They did what your power and will had decided beforehand should happen. Now, Lord, consider their threats. Enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. Stretch out your hand to heal and perform miraculous signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant Jesus. After they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken. They were filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. What is the first unique sign, right, that tells you, that makes you a Christian? You know what it is? It is the ability to serve consistently in the midst of suffering. It is the ability to serve consistently in the middle of trial, tribulation, and suffering. See, chapter 1 and 3, the church was doing well. Jesus went up. They started preaching. People were coming in. They broke bread together. They were having a ball. Everything was great. It was a great honeymoon period for the church. And all of a sudden, at the beginning of chapter 4, they begin to realize something. Peter and John got arrested, and they start realizing something really big. They said, some of us are going to actually die. If this continues, some of us are going to actually have to endure real suffering. They knew this going in. And their response to it was very noteworthy. Their response to it was what? They prayed. But look at their prayer. Okay? Look at their prayer. It wasn't to pray for protection. It said, God, protect us from these evil people. It wasn't to pray for their present circumstances. Deliver me, oh God, from the suffering that we're about to endure. They didn't pray for vengeance. Get those fools back, Lord. They mess with us, mess with them. What did they pray for? They prayed for courage to continue to let God change people through them. Verse 29 and 30, he says what? Now, Lord, consider their threats and enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. Stretch out your hand to heal and perform miraculous signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. Do you know what is the unique sign that makes you a Christian? Is that you are willing and that you are able to, to serve in the midst of trials and suffering. See, most people, when they face trials in the church, when they face trials before God, what do they do? You no longer give me what I want, God, therefore in return, I will no longer serve you. I was in it because I thought I was going to receive something back, and because I don't receive anything back, I am done with you. But a believer, a true Christian, a real believer would say this, I will serve God for nothing. That if in this moment, from this moment to the day I take my last breath, God does not bless me again, I will still bless his name. 
And if he ruins me, I will still praise him. I will still praise him. So you won't know, you won't know your life as a Christian until suffering comes. You won't know if the mark is real unless actual suffering comes. See, sometimes in the church, I see this all the time. People come to church and they, they get excited. You know, the community is nice, it's fun, people are good, we have a great time, right? And then what happens? They get jaded, something happens, right? Something is said, something was spoken, something um, was done, hurt their feelings or made them think otherwise. And what happens? They leave, they walk away, they disappear. Why were they there? It's because they received something. The moment they no longer had it, the the moment it no longer came to them, they walked away. See, they serve God, not for God. They serve God for the blessings that he comes and he gives to them. See, a mark of a real Christian, listen, church, is that you will be able to serve in the middle of suffering. You will consistently serve, even if you suffer. And you know this. You understand this. And yet, I bet you for a fact that you are hypocrites about it. Let me give you an example. If you have a friend, and you and your friend, you, you guys go out all the time, and you hook up your friends, you take them out, you feed them, you, you pay for the most of the stuff, and then one day you stop. One day you stop, and they stop being your friend. They stop calling you up. They stop hanging out with you. What would you say? That person wasn't in it for me. It wasn't, it wasn't really a real friendship. They were in it because they got something out of it. And because they stopped, it's done. Forget that. Right? You would think that. You would be bitter. You would be angry. And yet, you would allow the same thing to happen before God. You think that it's okay for some reason before God. That you can serve him, that you can do things with him, for him, as long as there's something in return. And the moment he stops, the moment suffering comes, the moment things get hard, you stop. Why? Because it wasn't him. It was the blessings you got from him. You didn't serve God for God. You served God for what he can give you. See, in the book of Job, right, that was the devil's number one, that was his number one accusation to Job. God would say, look at my servant Job. Is there anyone like him? And <laughs> Satan was like, dude, you blessed him. You hooked him up. Take it all away. Will Job serve you for nothing? Will he do it for nothing? Will he still call you God for nothing? And the whole book of Job, Job was like, ah, oh, God, why, why, right? But he always still did what? Oh, God. He never walked away. He didn't walk away. Because it wasn't about what he received. It was about God being God. All right? See, people, a lot of us, a lot of Christians, when they leave the church, what happens is what? They didn't serve God for God. They served God to get something out of it. And the question I have to ask you, simply, okay? And this is the origin story. This is not me. This is the origin story. This is the first marks of the real Christians here. Can you serve God for nothing? Can you give this life with full knowledge that you will get nothing in return? Can you consistently serve him if he does not bless you again? Do you serve him for nothing? Will you serve him for nothing? Because that is the mark. That is the true mark. Real Christian. All right? Number two. Okay. You got to know God deliberately. You got to know him in a personal way, a personal relationship with God. All right? You know, sometimes people graduate high school and they fall away. All right? They were really cool. They're very active in high school. They did a lot of things. They did the Bible studies. They, they prayed. They went to the services. They went to the retreats. They did all those things. And you're like, yo, this person is really active in the church. But you know, when they get to college, they fall away. Right? Or in college, they get really active. They go to missions. They did the stuff on campus. They did all these things. But then when they get into the work career, all of a sudden, they fall away. Why? You guys want to know why? Because it is very possible to have a secondhand relationship with God. It is very possible that your relationship with God was never personal. It was always kind of like osmosis from everyone else around you. It's because they were passionate that you kind of gravitate towards that passion. It's because they did it. That's how you gravitate towards it. But you never 
actually had a personal relationship with him. You knew that God died for the world, but you didn't really know that God died for you. There was no firsthand personal relationship. Most of the time when they fall away, when, when the people just leave, it's why. It's because their whole entire time in high school and college, it was because they were doing secondhand relationships with God. It was never personal. But a relationship, a real relationship, you guys, is what? It's a two-way communication, yeah? You can't have a relationship if it's just one way. Relationship is a two-way communication. And look at how this church in the beginning responded. Okay? A two-way relationship, a prayer. Sometimes they, all, so they just pray. What's, what's the big deal? No. A true prayer. I'm going to blow your mind right now because I just kind of came up. No, I didn't come up with it. But, like, you know, it's kind of like, whoa, okay? Anyways, a true prayer. You know what a true prayer is? A true prayer is not you speaking. It's actually you responding, you answering. A true prayer is you answering from something that has been spoken to you. That's a true prayer. See, otherwise, it's just what? A one-way relationship. Let me give you an example. Let's say you meet a guy, and he tells you his epic story about his life. The ups, the downs, the, the, the passions, the, the drives, the, 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 the beauty, the, the, the fall, all this. He, he paints to you this amazing story, and you're sitting there, and you're listening to it, and he's, just, he's telling you all like, the, the nuances that happened, the struggles of his life, his experiences. And then afterwards, when the story's done, he's finished, he looks at you, and you look at him, and you say, I really would like a chicken sandwich, right? What happens? One, either you're a douchebag, right? Or two, you're insane. If someone has spoken to you like that, a real conversation is you would answer back from that context, right? You wouldn't just go into it saying, hmm, I want this, I want that, I want this, I want that. You wouldn't say that, right? I came with this revelation, I was thinking to myself, if I never spoke to Seth, how would he know how to answer me, right? He talks a lot now, right? He talks too much, actually, right? So if I never spoke to him, if I never actually engaged with him, how would he actually know how to answer? His, his thing would be like, blah, 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 blah. He'd be just saying just babbles, right? But because I spoke to him, he knows exactly how to answer. His, his conversation, his, his speaking is not a one-way talk. It is an answer to my expression to him, right? Give an example. It's hilarious. Last night, right, we were putting together a Mother's Day gift, and, you know, Trisha went to the shower. So I went and I like, grabbed him. I was like, shh, okay, me, you, paint. He said, okay. Right? So I painted his hand. I did the thing on this, on this stupid cardboard thing, right? And I said, okay, we wash hands up. I said, shh, don't tell mom, okay? He said, okay. Don't tell mom that I give you candy tomorrow. He said, yes, right? Wash hands, threw him in the bed. We just laying there waiting for mom to come in. And the moment she walks in, he says, mommy, hand, paint, right? I'm like, what are you doing, you jerk, right? And she's like, paint? Paint what? Orange, blue, right? I was like, uh, I said, traitor, <laughs> stop talking, right? right? And then he said, he said, mommy, come, I show you, right? And so he gets up out of bed. I'm like, no! He walks over in there, right? I'm like, man, what a punk, right? But his whole entire, his whole entire demeanor was out of what? Me. With him first, right? He would never have been able to respond any way if it was not me connecting with him first. You guys follow me? Okay? So here it is. Look at their prayer. Okay? Look at their prayer. And it's not, it's not the typical, a hey, guy need this, guy need that. Look at their prayer, okay? And see how it works. Look at verse 24. And when they heard this, they raised their voices together in prayer. So what is their situation? Their fear, they're about to die. They fear they're about to get punished. They fear that they are about to get jailed. They fear that they know they're going to go through suffering. They know this. They have this kind of angst, anxiety, anxiousness, wonder, and fear. And all of a sudden, their first prayer is what? O sovereign Lord. O sovereign Lord. Who told them that the Lord was sovereign? Who expressed to them that the Lord, who is sovereign, sustains all things in their hands? Who told them that by his word, he spoke life and creation? Who told them that by his hand he holds it all together? Who? It was the Lord. And so here they are, wondering about their future, cannot understand what will happen, and they begin 
to pray, not by asking, help me, but they begin by saying, let me answer you. Because you have showed me your characteristic. You have spoken your attribute to me. And so let me answer back, O sovereign Lord. You made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything in them. You spoke by the Holy Spirit to the mouth of your servant, our father David. Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? This is Psalm 2. Okay, if you guys know where this came from, this is Psalm 2. They were quoting scripture, the thing that the very word of God is speaking into their hearts. The kings of the earth take their stand, and the rulers gather together against the Lord and against his anointed one. So why would they do that? You are the sovereign Lord. How vain, how foolish nations rise up against you. And we know it, we see it, because how? Look at verse 27. Indeed, Harold, Pontius Pilate, met together with the Gentile and the people of Israel in this city to conspire against your holy servant, Jesus, whom you anointed. You know when Jesus was arrested? You know when Jesus was trialed unfairly? You know when Jesus was flogged, when he was put the crown on? When we as believers saw that, we could not possibly imagine anything good that came out of that. We could not possibly imagine how can these men who plot against you, how can they be winning? How could they possibly be winning? But the answer was what? They did what your power and will had decided beforehand should happen. What did they realize? It was in your hand. Even in the midst of the craziest suffering, it was already in your hand. Not just in your hand, it was already in your will. You willed for it to happen. And what was the result of that will? We come to know the living Father. Right? Verse 29. Now, Lord, consider their threats and enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. What are they saying? I have seen it, God. I have heard. Now that I am myself about to go through this trial, now that I am about to go through this suffering, now that I am about to be punished, and I can't possibly see a future out of this, one thing I know for a fact, one thing I know is true, as I answer you, is that you have told me that you are sovereign Lord. You have told me that nations plot in vain against you. How foolish of them. That's what you have told me. And so my answer back to you is this. Then, oh God, hear these threats and enable me to do your will. What were they praying? That was a relationship. That was a prayer of a real relationship. It wasn't, I need this, I need that. Now, Are you allowed to pray for needs? Of course. The Bible, the Lord asks for it. But their primary prayer was not give me protection, deliver me from my circumstances, give me vengeance. Their primary prayer was let me answer what you have spoken to me. I have heard and now I have seen. Right? They were scared. They were scared. But can you hear their prayer? They were praying for their healing. In their very prayer, they were finding their healing. Imagine, I mean, no one, none of us has actually faced death before. I mean, like, personally, I hope not, right? To a point where we're, like, wondering the future, how, how bad things can possibly get. We were wondering all the, none of us got that. But they were there. They were wondering, what is going to happen? I'm going to suffer. I'm going to possibly die. I'm going to probably be thrown in jail. What future is there for me? And they say, oh, sovereign Lord. O sovereign Lord, you who hold all things in your hands, I'm not afraid. Because what looks like the nations plotting in vain and winning, it was your will from the beginning. O sovereign Lord. See, a relationship is two ways. Right? See, the, the unique sign that makes you a real Christian is this. One, are you able can you serve consistently in the middle of suffering? Though he slay you, right, will you praise his name? Though he take from you, will you still bless him? Though he ruin you, will you still declare that he is good? The second unique sign is that you have a personal relationship with It's personal. It actually is to you. You're not secondhand from anybody. It's to you. 
He's spoken to you, and you know he's spoken to you. And it's a relationship because why? You have answered him back. Let me tell you guys something. The only way that can happen is you actually know the word of God. They quoted. How did they know what God was saying? Because they quoted from him. Oh, I am in the midst of a lot of fear, oh God, but let me quote for what you have already told me, that you are sovereign. Some of us, we say some random stuff sometimes. We kind of gen- do this generic, like, Christian, like, lingo, thinking like it's going to cover everything. God is good, right? Do you know your scripture? Do you know it so well that you can call upon it and answer what he has spoken to you about? Do you know it? I had a joke. This kid, and he was a PK. He's a PT. I'm, 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 I'm okay. I said, why? I'm a PK. I'm a pastor's kid. So what do you mean? You know, the Bible says, you know, like, pastor's kid receives their children's blessings, with their father's blessings, right? So what does that mean? I'm going to heaven. It doesn't matter, right? I, mean, I, don't, I don't think it works that way, bro. He's like, have you, have you read your Bible? Yeah, it's in there. Trust. Trust, right? I mean, it's, it's, I hear it all the time. Okay? And here you are. Here, they, here he is thinking he has his relationship with God. And God's like, and, and you know, he's, God's telling this epic story to this kid. And he's like, the answer is, I'm okay. You didn't really hear me, did you? Right? Either one, you're a douchebag or you're just insane. Right? Did you even hear what I said to you? Have you even heard what I have spoken to you? And that's your response? So what makes you a real Christian? Going to church does not make you a real Christian. It's necessary, but it's not sufficient. Right? Knowing the doctrines does not make you a real Christian. I mean, it's necessary, but it's not sufficient. Being a good person does not make you a real Christian. Because why? It's necessary, but it's not sufficient. The unique signs of the original Christians, where they were able to serve in the midst of suffering, they had an actual personal relationship with their God. And you can see it in the way they prayed. You can see it in the way they spoke to him. It wasn't asking, but it was answering. Is that you? Here's the third one. All right. Look at verse 31. So here they were, okay? Here they were. They're freaking out. Peter and John told them these things. They begin to pray. They say, Sovereign Lord, you are in control of all things. You have all things under control. I'm going to quote scripture to you. And I've seen it happen through, through, through Jesus, how the nations try to destroy him. But yet you, it was all in your control. And so in the same way, enable us. And after they have prayed that. After they have said that, what happens? After they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken, okay? The Bible was the original shook, okay? It was not, it was, I don't know where you guys got it from. It's, from. it's from the Bible. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. They were filled with the Holy Spirit. I know this is a term that we use all the time. Be filled with the Holy Spirit, Okay? Because they were willing to serve God consistently in suffering. Because they were willing to know God personally. The result was they were filled with the Holy Spirit. Let me, t- let me explain what this means, okay? okay? Being filled with the Holy Spirit does not mean you were a pagan for a second, and all of a sudden you're walking and boom, oh Lord, it's just filled me, right? I'm just full of the Spirit now, right? It does not mean that. It does not mean that all of a sudden you're sitting there and then you just, I, I can feel him right now in my bones, right? It does not mean that, okay? If you had the Spirit, you've always had the Spirit. It didn't go anywhere, okay? Being filled with the Spirit means this. It means the Spirit takes what Jesus and God has said and done, and now it makes it a reality to you becomes a true reality. What were they doing? God, we know. We heard that you are sovereign. We're quoting scripture. We're answering back. How can the nations plot in vain? We've seen what you have done through the work of Jesus. Enable us. And in, in that moment, what happened? The actual sovereignty of God. <coughs> they got it. It wasn't just in their head. It became a reality to their very being. It became a reality to their very soul. 
They were filled with the Spirit and they became bold. Something that you understood up here now becomes reality. Mm. That's what it means to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Let me give you an example. If I'm married, I'm married, right? right? I'm married. I'm married. I'm married. I'm married. I'm married. That means I'm married, right? You know? But let's say I come, I take my wife, and I grab her, right, and I kiss her passionately. Does that make me any less married a second ago before I grabbed her and kissed her passionately? No, right? It just means, right, I am now experiencing the love of the marriage. Does that make sense, right? I'm still married, right? But now I'm experiencing the love of the marriage, okay? A mark of a real Christian is this. You experience God periodically. Come to an actual experience of God periodically. Can I give you an example? You guys know that phrase I always use, there's no such thing as lost causes, right? You know that phrase? I never used that phrase before I came to TLC. Do you guys know that? I swear, I've never used that phrase. I mean, I understood grace when I was at the Korean church, right? But I think somewhere deep down in my head, I was thinking I'm still better than you, right? I think so. I think that was, that was in my head, right? Even though I, I won't say it out loud, I was thinking, hmm, I'm pretty sure. I'm grace, I understand, but... I'm still probably better than you, right? In my head, right? I can quote it to you. I can give you the theology behind it. I can, like, you know, give you all the verses. But the reality of it would never made itself whole until I actually came to TLC. I think God wanted me to know that because I'm at TLC, right? You know? And when the reality of God's grace hit, you know what? You know what? I was... I remember I was sitting there, and when the reality of his grace hit my heart, you know the first thing that came to my mind? The first word that I said is, I am a lost cause. I was the lost cause. And so how can I possibly ever look at a brother or a sister and ever imagine them to be the lost cause? To ever say that they are the lost cause? And when that reality hits, right, that's when I begin to say, you know what? Let's give the benefit of the doubt to our brothers and our sisters. Let's love them. Right? And let's look upon them not as people who've done wrong, though there are many people who do wrong. Right? And not look upon them as if they are the lost causes and somehow that you are better. When the reality is what? You yourself are the lost cause. Right? I didn't understand grace, honestly. Right? Until I was filled with the Spirit. Being filled with the Spirit, all it means is that He has taken something that He has always told you. And he's made it the reality of your heart. Right? Some of you guys, maybe you've experienced it. I think some of you guys have experienced it. Where you constantly, maybe, like, you, you think that God can never love you. There's guilt and there's shame that's just overwhelming to your soul. And all of a sudden, you come and you sing a song or you hear a word. You're at a place and the reality of his love hits. Boom. And all that guilt and all that shame just disappears. Because what you have known up here, now has become the reality here. That's what it means to be filled with the Spirit. The Spirit makes Jesus beautiful, more beautiful to you. That's what the Spirit does. He makes Jesus more beautiful to you. Okay? I remember I shared a time when I was um, at uh, the supermarket, ABC supermarket. I, I just watched uh, Narnia, right? And I remember I was like, I, was, I, was like, I don't know, it's the weirdest like, connection, but I, I saw the lion, and my head was like, dude, God is so crazy. And then it just, it just, I was standing there with my grandma. My grandma thought I was crazy, right? She's like, why are you, like, are you crying? I'm like, no, what the heck is wrong with me, right? <laughs> I'm dying or something, you know? I'm like, I was just sitting there, and I was just like, it was like, I think it was a minute, but it felt like an hour. And I was just like, God, you are, what I know about you is a tip of an iceberg. There is so much more to know, and I want to know it all. That was the moment. I mean, that was one of the few times when the reality of his bigness, his, his grandness, is hit. Right? The cool thing about this is that it's periodical. Right? So you don't have to be an emotional high all the time. Right? You know, so if you're sitting there and you're like, I don't really get like, very emotional. I don't get it why, like, some of these guys are, like, just constantly crying all the time. Like, God, I love you, right? I just need you, right? And they're like, dang, like, I must be, like, not human or something, you know? It's periodical. It doesn't come on all the time. You, you don't have to live an emotional high all the time. There are moments where he will just 
something will happen, and he will make his reality known to you. That's how you know. That's how you know that you are a real Christian. And this is amazing because you know why? It gives you something to look forward to, that it's going to happen. Are you hungry for it to happen? And this is sometimes I, I pray for this. So I pray that sometimes in our church that the reality of sin hits our hearts. All right? I really do. Sometimes I do pray for that. The reality of actual sin and how it actually separates us from God actually hits our hearts. That we're not just laughing about it. We're not just joking about it. Like, oh, we're all sinners. It's true. I mean, all that's true, right? We're all sinners. But for the reality of it to hit so deeply that you would say, that you would say like the tax collector, oh God, forgive me, for I am a sinner. And you would pound your heart in the back of the room, not because there's no seat in front, but you actually sit back there because, mm, God, right? I pray sometimes for the reality of sin to hit our hearts as a church. You know what it also means? It means that the reality that you can overcome your sins is real too. Some of you guys, you sit and you think, I can never overcome that addiction. There's this thing that I do that no one knows about that it cannot be, it cannot be free from. Can I tell you something? That is a lie. That is a lie. Because when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and the reality of God comes upon you, especially in that area, he shines light to that area. You know what happens? It cannot stand. It will disintegrate. Because the reality of God becomes your life. You ask why prostitutes, tax collectors, people who've done so many things, all of a sudden, overnight, they switch. Right? Isn't that, isn't that, isn't that weird? Like, like their, their testimony is so crazy because overnight, it just seems like they stopped everything. It's not because they just willed it. Like, oh, I'm going to stop. I have to. Good person. No. It's because the reality of God hit their soul. And what they knew was wrong. What they knew was painful. What they knew was, an, was a brokenness before him became a reality. And they did nothing but repent from it. And it changed their heart. And they stopped. So I pray, right? Sometimes the reality of sin will hit your heart. How do you know? What makes you the sign that you are a real Christian? One, you are willing to serve consistently in the midst of suffering. Two, you have a deliberate relationship, personal relationship with him. And three, you experience him periodically. Are you hungry for that? Here's the last thing, okay? So after they were filled with the Spirit, you understand, that's so, I mean, when I, when I, when I came to my heart, it, it, it was so crazy because they were praying for, they were praying for hope in the future and they spoke to God, I know that you're sovereign, God, and all of a sudden the Holy Spirit filled them. You know what that meant? That meant the reality that God is in charge, that God wins all, that God is, holds everything in his hand, was so real to them that the next thing they did was what? They spoke the word of God boldly. They weren't afraid anymore. They were afraid in the beginning from verse 23, but at verse 30, they were not afraid anymore. They became bold because the the Spirit filled them. And what was their action? Look at verse 32. And all believers were one in heart and mind. No one claimed that any of his possession was his own, but they shared everything they had. With great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and much grace was upon them all. There were no needy persons among them. From time to time, those who owned lands or houses sold them, brought, them, brought the money from the sales, and put it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to anyone as he had need. Joseph, a Levite from Cyprus, whom the apostles called Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, sold a field he owned and brought the money and put it at the apostles' feet. You know what sign comes out? is that you become generous. You become radically generous. Okay? They were bold after they prayed, and right after that, they did what? They gave their money away. Okay? One of the reasons, why, what's one of the reasons why we aren't generous? One, we're materialistic. Right? Two, we're greedy. Right? We're greedy as heck. But one of the other reasons why we don't give our money away or, give a, or be generous is because we're afraid. We're actually afraid. Money is the, it's, it's the sense of security, right? See, if, if God is not the center of your heart, 
then you have, must have something else that gives you security. And most of the time, it's money. Money gives me security. Your savings, your investment. Now, hold up. I'm not saying don't have a savings. And I'm not saying don't have an investment. What I'm saying is, don't let that be your security. Don't let that be something that you fall back on. See, because if God is the center of your heart, the resulting sign that you are continuously being generous. Right? When God is spiritually real to your heart, you're able to give more of it away because you know in whom you have your real security. You know it. You're not just saying it now, you actually know it. A real security. Now, this is not my shameless plug for us to give at church, okay? And you guys, you guys know, think about this, okay? Think, I want you guys to do a thought experiment real fast. If you learn to be generous and you give generously anywhere else, I'm okay. If we have to downsize TLC, I'm okay. As long as your heart, because think about this, we, we're, we're doing church out of a trailer, Okay? Ooh, like how much more like do we need, right? We're doing church out of a trailer. And most of the time we meet at what? At houses anyways. We don't need anything crazy. I don't mind if we downsize. So, and I mean that with all my heart. So it's not about, it's not about whether you want to give TLC or not. My heart is this. If you learn to be generous and you give generously to save a kid, you give generously to save the world. I don't know. You give generously for something. And it's consistent. That's a win. That's a win for a pastor. Honestly. All right? Well, we can't pay our mortgage. It's okay. Right? It's, I think one of our houses is as big as this. We can meet. It doesn't matter. We're meeting out of a trailer. You can you realize that we're meeting out of a trailer? Okay? We don't need, we don't even need anything grand in the beginning. So if we downsize, we downsize. But if you are generous, that's amen. Right? Because that tells me what? That tells me you understand the heart of what it means to have generosity, right? One of the unique signs of a Christian, a real Christian, in the beginning was what? They became increasingly generous as the years goes by. They are increasingly generous as the year goes by. You guys follow me? Four signs, okay? Four signs. Tell me, tell you guys something. Church, doctrine, being good, necessary but not sufficient. The unique signs that marks a believer that they are able to serve in the midst of suffering, they have a personal relationship with God, that they are experiencing God periodically, and that their life is marked by generosity. Okay? How can we do this? How can we do this without being shook? Right? How can we do this without being shook? Right? You know how? Look at verse 31. Go fast. The answer is Jesus, but let me just get to verse 31. Okay? After they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken. It was an earthquake. You know, in the scripture, every time an earthquake came, you know what that means? The presence of God. Right? When Israel was taken to Mount Sinai, Moses says, do not touch the mountain or you will be killed by it. Right? Because the presence of the Lord shook the mountain. Moses asked, can I see your face? No, you cannot, because if you do, I will shake you to pieces. You will die. When Isaiah saw the throne of God and the temple of God, and what happens? The temple shook at the presence of God, and he said what? I deserve to die. Every time there was a shaking of of an earthquake, it was the presence of God. You know why something shakes? It's because something greater is in contact with something less, right? And it will destroy you. In the New Testament, the earthquake shook twice. Matthew 27, Jesus died and there was an earthquake. Right? It shook the earth. Something was coming down. What was it? God's judgment to Jesus. It shook. The earth shook because God's judgment came upon Jesus. He says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And he breathed his last breath and the earth shook. The temple veil tore. Right? Temple veil tore, right? On Easter Sunday, the earth shook and the stone was rolled away. What was shaking? Death was being shooken. Shooken, is that a word? (laughs) Shook is not a word, huh? Shook. Death was being shook, right? You know what that means? This is when, think about it. 
every time earthquake comes, the response of the believer, the response of, the, of a person who knows God was fear. The earth shook in this verse, and what happened? They became bold. Why? Because Jesus was saying, I was shook so that you would be unshakable. Okay? Is that a joke? I was, oh, I'm sorry. I actually wrote that. I was shook so you would be unshakable. Okay? You're ruining the moment right now, okay? <laughs> I got what you deserve so that you can know his love and be unshakable. The believers were unshakable. That's how they were able to serve consistently in the midst of suffering. They were unshakable. That's why when they spoke, it wasn't about what they needed. It was about, let me answer to what you have told me, God. They were unshakable. That's how the Lord met them. and They did not die. They were unshakable. That's why they were bold and say, what I have is yours. It's not mine. Jesus says, I was shaken so you would not have to be. Yes, follow? All right, let's pray. Shook us. Let's bow our heads. Church, can I ask you a very honest question? Where are you at? Right. What is your relationship with God? Do you, are you in the realm of necessary but, sufficient, but not sufficient? Or are you really marked by the realness of what Christ has done? Because I don't know where you're at. Right? I can only assume or guess and pray for it. I don't know where you're at. But if the word of God spoke to your heart today, the answer is just come home. Come. Come to this place. Right? If you have run, if you have hidden yourself, if you have just pretended and you lived as if these actions that you are doing, that you're thinking that they're necessary and they're sufficient, the answer is no. Can you serve in the midst of suffering? Can you have this relationship with him? Do you answer him? Do you experience him? And do you see yourself growing generous? Come home, church. He's saying that. I was broken so that you will never be broken. I took on the very weight, the judgment of my father, so you will be standing in him in glory. So come. So wherever you're at, wherever your heart is at, maybe there's places of repentance that needs to come. Maybe there's a reality that you're praying that God will make known to you. Maybe there's a freedom in your heart that you're praying, Lord, I need to not just understand it, but God, I pray that I will know it in my soul. It's time to come and ask. Come and cry out to the sovereign Lord. Come and cry out to the God who is the God of all the ages. Come and cry out to your Jehovah Jireh, to your Emmanuel. Come and cry out to who he is, what he has revealed to you in his word. Answer him. Don't speak to him. Answer him. Wherever it is.
Holy Spirit, we come before you and we ask, Spirit, make your word a reality to our hearts. Make Jesus more beautiful to us each moment. Holy Spirit, we come and we ask what we have known all our lives. <clears throat> Would you make it the reality of our souls? Would your word have spoken to our heads? Would you make it the reality of our hearts? <coughs> Lord, teach us to be bold. Sovereign Lord, teach us not to be afraid. Why did the nations plot against us, against you? Why did the kings and the rulers think that they can stand before you? <coughs> you are sovereign, O oh Lord. You are in control. Come and be a reality to us now. Quick announcements, guys. Quick announcements. All right, v group, uh, VG Retreat. If you guys are interested in going to a retreat with our Vietnamese group, they are a 1.5 generation group that is uh, very necessary to our church. They are able to really just be a blessing to a lot of the international students that come over here. And they're throwing a retreat, and if you want to get to know them or you're actually excited to go uh, and you want to be there, uh, that is the date. Those are the dates, and that's the pricing. If you guys see food, well, just come see me. I'll give you some more information about that. All right? Next one. Rise up. Hey, you know, every year uh, we, are, we have a, um, a group here at TLC that dances. It's called PD Square, and it's a dance showcase that we are actually a part of uh, over there, and it just takes up all the talents uh, in, in the area, local area, the Orange County area, of just Christian dancers and really... Um, show what the Lord has been doing to a lot of people, you know, how we can really redeem dance and make it into something that's an expression of our love for God. And one, one of the amazing things is that every year they pick a nonprofit to kind of uh, sponsor, and this year they pick one of ours. They pick the Hope uh, that we work with in Peru. And so uh, all, all proceeds after their cost, the bottom line, right, goes to TL, or goes to um uh, the ministry and, and, and the mission. So please, if you guys are interested, $10 a ticket, talk to Ray. I think he's somewhere in the fellowship hall. Okay, um, he'll, he'll uh, definitely do that. Evan's graduation, our brother Griffin is graduating. Yeah, you know, four long years of ministry. He is a master of divinity now, right? He is a um, master. He's a master of divinity. It's May 20th, 10 a.m. at Hillside Community Church in Rancho Cucamonga, 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 right? Uh, come out, come out and uh, celebrate a long, arduous process, right? He's finally finished, um, and let's go and um, celebrate with him. Okay, next one, uh, dance workshop. So this coming Wednesday, our, our small group, uh, TK, right? <laughs> sorry, our small group TK is uh, holding a dance workshop at Anaheim Discovery School, uh, May 17th, Wednesday at 7 p.m., okay? So if you are interested in just coming out to dance, uh, there's going to be a dance workshop there anyway, so uh, we're going to um, kick it with a lot of the Discovery kids, and so come out and uh, be a part of that. There's going to be food, and it'll be there, okay? So come out to that, please. And lastly, that is it. That's it. Uh, VBS, hey, guys, look, 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 at our, look at our dear brother Kevin, right? He, he had to have a meme to tell him to do VBS, okay? So he's stressed out. The brother is stressed out. You know, Jesus is knocking on his window, I think, or something. So uh, make his life easy by just coming and say, here I am. Use me, okay? Uh, please uh, come on, uh, help out with the VBS program this coming year, okay? I think that's it, yes. Uh, let's pray for our, um, let's pray for our announcements. Bow our heads. Uh, Father, we lift up these announcements to you. Um, they are just thoughts and things that we put together, Lord, in hopes and in prayer that they are part of your will. And so we are, we are more, uh, more than willing and more flexible to change it as you wish. And so, God, we want to lift them up to you, um, our dances, our workshops, our ways of reaching out. May it be, Lord God, um, your will and your desire 
And may you impact and touch as many people as possible with it. But if anything, Father, you want to change, give our hearts the nudge and teach us, Lord God, uh, to be flexible through it all. Thank you so much, Lord. We praise you. We pray all these things in your name. Amen. Can we all rise? Let me send you guys out. Um, would you like to put your hands out as a posture of receiving? Okay. O sovereign Lord, why do the nations plot against you? Why do kings and rulers think that they can stand before you and your anointed ones? Lord, send us out this week. Well, not just with words, understanding in our heads, but Lord, a deep conviction of your reality in our hearts, that we may take it and be a vessel of change to the world around us. We praise you, Lord. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Go in peace, church.